morning, everyone. Um, we're here at the DACA Global Dialogue 2019. Um, we would like to discuss financing for development, partnerships for growth. Um, I am Mignon Berger, a consultant in international trade and development in Germany. Um, I'd like to introduce Ashok Kumar. He's a Deputy General Manager, Export Import Bank India. On my right is Senia Kirilova. She's a Knowledge Management Analyst at the United Nations Development Programme. And from the wonderful Bangladesh, we have Nihad Kabir, the President of the Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Dhaka. Um, financing for development and partnerships for growth has changed in the last few years, and countries are setting the agenda in the Indo-Pacific region. The nature of financing has changed from government to government and financial institutions and with the development agencies. Mr. Kumar, please help us to explain, as an export credit agency, what is your role and mandate in development financing? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, this opportunity. Now, uh, export credit agencies have a very uh, important role uh, when it comes to economic development and as the economies uh, expand and their global outreach expands, uh, uh, so does the role of ECS. So as an export import bank of India, I just want to inform you that we are fully owned by government of India. We have um, a mandate of uh, financing, facilitating and promoting exports out of India. And uh, this mandate we fulfill uh, through uh, various uh, types of uh, credit programs, both sovereign as well as uh, uh, commercial credits. And uh, our role um, helps us uh, and puts us in, into a situation where uh, we uh, are able to uh, become a part of government's uh, economic diplomacy. And that is how uh, uh, we help uh, Indian companies to go abroad and, and help other countries uh, to achieve their uh, developmental goals. That sounds great. What are the various credit instruments through which you can contribute on development financing? Yeah, as I just said, like any other credit agency uh, and development financial uh, institutions, uh, all these uh, institutions provide a credit which is big in volume, which has greater, uh, longer tenure, and at the same time, uh, low pricing. The countries in the developmental stage, they need uh, uh, such kind of uh, uh, credit facilities. And uh, because uh, most of the countries which are in uh, initial stages of development, they uh, don't have a robust capital market. Their banking system doesn't have uh, that capacity to sustain the infrastructure. So that is where the financial institutions and ECS come and play their role. Now coming to Export Import Bank of India, we have both uh, commercial credits and, and uh, the sovereign credits available. In the context of this discussion, I would like to focus more on the sovereign credits. Uh, when it comes to sovereign credit, we have uh, Government of India credit lines. Then we have uh, buyer's credit under National Export Insurance Account. And then we also have uh, um, uh, uh, concessional financing scheme. So as we speak, uh, uh, if, if I focus only on Indo-Pacific region, which is topic of the day, uh, we have uh, uh, several Government of India credit lines uh, to, to countries like Bangladesh, to Myanmar, to Vietnam, to Lao PDR, to, to Cambodia, and even up to Papua New Guinea. So we have a credit commitment of near about $14 billion uh, on, on sovereign credit side and near half a billion in, in commercial space. Uh, 
uh, if I talk about only Bangladesh, so we have a, a credit commitment of commitments of near about 10 billion dollars, and we under these uh, credit lines, we are in the process of financing uh, all kind of infrastructure projects, whether it is uh, power generation, whether it is uh, power transmission lines, road infrastructure, uh, health facilities, IT facilities, uh, and and railway and then irrigation and, and all, all such kind of projects. Thank you. With the $14 million, what kind of projects have you also financed so far in the Indo-Pacific region? So in, in this region, as I just said, uh, uh, in Bangladesh we have uh, three uh, railway projects which are already uh, uh, under uh, progress. There's a Dhaka Tongi railway line, then Kalora Shahbazpur railway line is there, then uh, Khulna Mongla railway line is there and I would also like to specify here that uh, uh, one of uh, Bangladesh's big biggest power plant that is Maitri Thermal Power Plant uh, that also we are we have financed and it is under progress the progress is going really well and um, uh, we have financed almost uh, uh, about one one 1.6 billion dollars for this project so similarly we have uh, projects in automobile sector also we have uh, supported several countries in their transportation system, uh, buses, tracks for in infrastructure projects. So these projects we have financed in Myanmar also, uh, in, uh, and in, in Cambodia, in, in uh, Laopedia also we have projects in uh, power transmission uh, lines and, and irrigation. With all the um, credit unions, uh, um, credit lines and financing for the Indo-Pacific region, we look forward to a, much, um, a lot more success stories. Thank you very much, Mr. Ashok. Kumar? Ms. Kirilova, at the UNDP, the global outlook on financing for sustainability, please um, elaborate on SDG 17, which is on partnerships. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to take part in the discussion. And uh, of course, as I work for UNDP, I will talk uh, first about the SDG in general. So the SDGs are, as you all know, the milestone and uh, sort of a blueprint to achieve more sustainable future for all of us. And of course, um, they address all the SDGs, uh, address very important issues and crucial ones, uh, including poverty, including reducing poverty, including inequality, and also climate change and others. And one of the most important from my point of view is SDG 17, which I work for. Uh, it's called Partnership for Goals, and it's mostly about building sustainable partnership for the different development projects across the globe. And um, the, the core point of SDG 17 is about, um, is about mobilizing, redirecting and uh, unlocking the funds, the financial funds, from um, not only from the government, but also from private sector and uh, from civil society. So um, it, it's not aimed only at governments. Um, and I would like to emphasize that SDG 17 is built around five pillars, five, I can say, components. And the first component, which is the most crucial one for the achieving this SDG, is finance, which is we talk about today. And talking about finance, um, um, there are five objects which SDG 17 would like to achieve. And the first one is to reinforce resource mobilization to enhance domestic tax capacity. Uh, another one, uh, which is also very important, is about uh, developing um, uh, and mobilizing extra financial resources. And there are also issues of assisting developing nations in uh, achieving debt sustainability. So it's also about debt sustainability and about implementation of um, investment promotion administrations for the least developed nations. So 
I guess this is um, sort of framework for, for our discussion. Like SDG 17 is mostly about partnerships and achieving sustainability in the global context. Okay. Thank you. With uh, your work at the UNDP and with SDG 17, what are your Russian partnerships and what is it for? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so first I would like to emphasize that um, there is a um, UNDP partnership office uh, which, uh, which helps to build and enhance partnership with the Russian Federation, with the help of Russian Federation, and we work with um, our three respective partners. The first one is Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Economic Development, and um, of course, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is one of the core partners. And with the help of these partners, uh, we signed the partnership agreement between the Russian Federation and UNDP. Uh, it was signed in 2015 and it brought the cooperation between Russia and UNDP to a qualitatively different level. And um, we also signed the trust fund agreement, which helped to elaborate a very efficient, uh, sustainable um, financial mechanism for uh, financing the development projects uh, in the CIS region mostly. And um, also um, uh, how it works, I mean the, the whole financial mechanism. Russia contributes to the trust fund and the trust fund elaborates uh, the, fin the finance aid to different projects in the CIS region, but not only in the CIS region, but in some African countries and in such countries as Lao PDL, for example. So, uh, what should I mention? Uh, if we talk about finance and financial uh, uh, aid, which is provided by the Russian Federation, um, the portfolio of the projects exceeds uh, $80 million, which is a, a great sum for the sustainable development projects. And um, we have um, several thematic windows inside the trust fund. We have a special window which is aimed at um, climate resilience and it, it's called climate change window and it mostly funds the projects within this, the area of expertise. And another one is on the youth empowerment um, in the region, uh, which is also very sustainable in terms of the projects. So um, I can, I should mention that Russia does not only provide finance for the projects uh, under UNDP, but also it provides expertise, which is, I guess, uh, at least of the same importance, because Russia provides expertise sharing. Uh, it means that Russian experts uh, participate in the implementation of the projects which UNDP finances, and this is a really uh, great thing to develop and I guess that we should work more on this component of uh, our partnership. Thank you. It is good to see that there's um, empowerment of youth and women and ensuring that the young Russian can also have opportunities in working with uh, the UNDP. Um, in this Russia-UNDP relationship, um, and the future of the transition. Could you please tell us more about different financial instruments? So mainly, uh, Russian one of the main Russian financial is instrument is this trust fund. And I guess that the, the future of the partnership between Russia and UNDP will mostly generate around this financial me mechanism because, uh, you know, it was uh, recognize that this mechanism is really fruitful and uh, important in the development of the partnership. Uh, I guess there will be more, more thematic scopes. I mean, uh, you talked about, you mentioned the women empowerment, but this is exactly the topic which we are elaborating just now. And I guess apart from the climate uh, change window and the youth window, we will also have some kind of women empowerment window. Uh, and it will mostly be um, oriented at the economic empowerment of women in Russia. Uh, but we are not 
finished yet, I mean, with this area, and I guess that uh, women empowerment will not be the last uh, thematic scope which we cover. So maybe in the future we will come up with some more financial instruments, but now we have only this trust fund mechanism, which provides to be a very efficient one. Thank you. We look forward to hearing more about the future of UNDP in Russia. Ms. Kabir, as president of the Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Dhaka, please tell us more about your work here, especially in Bangladesh. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and Industry is uh, the oldest uh, commerce and industry chamber in Bangladesh. It was set up in 1904, and it continues to represent large industry and trade. Um, our main job is advocacy from the point of view of the private sector and engagement with the government in policy formation, carrying out an ongoing policy dialogue uh, with a view to uh, ongoing policy reforms uh, to enable the growth of the economy, the growth of business and to foster ethical business practices in, in the country. So we spend a lot of time interacting with our members and uh, feeding that input into the policy-making mechanism of the government. Right. I hope you have a very big membership. Um, what are the successful industries and how do they fit into Bangladesh's development story? I think everybody in the world possibly now knows that the garments industry, the red meat garments industry, is the mainstay of our uh, industrial economy in a way. Um, and this uh, sector kicked off in the 1980s and has now grown to be the second largest in the world after China, uh, which I, is no mean feat for a country uh, which is only now 48 years old. Um, the, the garments industry provides jobs, uh, not only directly, but also through backward linkages. Having said that, there are several other sectors which have a big impact on the economy. Uh, we have our, our agriculture sector. It's mostly private sector-based agriculture, farming. Uh, we have a significant amount of unskilled, semi-skilled, and also to an extent skilled workers, uh, significant numbers working globally. So the remittances they send in are another mainstay of our economy. And uh, recently we have started concentrating on trying to diversify our export portfolio from garments to products like uh, pharmaceuticals, light industry. I'm sure you don't know that most of the bicycles used in Europe are made in Bangladesh. Um, and there are, there are other industries like shipbuilding and shipbreaking and all that. Now all of this comes together so that when we set our development agenda, um, we concentrate on trying to provide the infrastructure, the physical and the soft infrastructure for all these industries to grow. We also have made huge uh, steps forward in uh, service industries, for example, telecoms, uh, IT. And for that, one of the things both private sector and government wishes to focus on now is skill development. Thank you very much. Um, the garment industry as a success story is something that I actually was aware of yesterday to find out that m and is, um, man the products for their clothing is manufactured here in Bangladesh. And that's very impressive. Um, what is Bangladesh's approach to regional connectivity and infrastructural development? Uh, to put your question in a little bit of context, Bangladesh is in the process of graduating from a least developed country into a developing country and has already uh, reached the low middle income status. Um, as a result of that, I mean, that's, a, that's a great story of our progress. But as a result of that, over the next uh, decade, decade and a half, we stand to lose some of the beneficial financing from multilateral aid agencies, 
or the concessional windows uh, from those agencies and, and some other preferences from our uh, trade partners. So we need to plan for that. And uh, in order to do that, what we are going to prioritize, at least I hope we are going to prioritize, is technology upgrades, particularly and uh, skills development, productivity enhancement, and uh, the management uh, capacity development for higher competitive strength. Now, if we need to do that, we can't do it in isolation. We need to uh, engage regionally and globally. For that, uh, we will have to have a highly proactive trade policy, and we are going to have to start taking advantage of regional and sub-regional uh, trade cooperation. In order to do that again, and if we want to take the benefit of South-South cooperation and the huge markets that China and India offer us, um, and also the access that Bangladesh can give to other countries through manufacturing products in Bangladesh, we will need to work on regional connectivity, physical connectivity, physical infrastructure development, roads, railways, ports. Uh, we've recently had uh, in the Bangladesh dialogue, very recently, um, in Assam, with a view to using uh, Bangladesh port facilities um, to uh, enable India to the main body of India to connect with its northeastern states. But as a counter to that, uh, additionally to that, what we would like to do is be able to use India's port in Mundra to take our goods, not just to India, but to Europe at a much shorter span of time at a much lesser cost. So all these things are coming together in, in uh, how we design our future development agenda. Thank you. We are looking forward to all the success stories, especially with your work at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we would have to conclude now. Um, it would be great if each of you gives a closing remark and um, for us to conclude on our impressive discussion on financing for development and partnerships for growth. Thank you. Okay. Um, as a concluding remark, I would like to say that uh, <coughs> Globalization is a, is a buzzword since last three decades. And uh, when it comes to globalization, it doesn't, in, in today's context, it doesn't stop at uh, just the international trade. When the company, uh, countries, uh, they are in a phase of development, they have aspirations not only to grow their domestic economies, uh, but also they talk about uh, knowledge sharing, uh, about the experience sharing, uh, regional connectivity and connecting with other countries. And I think uh, uh, now is the time uh, uh, that, especially in, in Indo Pacific region, which is otherwise quite disconnected when it comes to country to country connectivity, uh, they should uh, probably look, look into this aspect. Uh, a lot of work has already been done. Uh, ECAs and development financial institutions has uh, a very important role to play uh, in this. Uh, the development financial institutions like uh, Asian Development Bank, JABIC, JICA, and there are several other uh, ex export credit agencies in this region who are doing their work and from uh, our side, Export Import Bank of India is, uh, as I uh, just explained in previous questions, um, we are doing our, our part and we hope uh, uh, that the future would be quite good for, for uh, this region, for uh, the collaboration between the uh, uh, countries and, and regional growth and, and prosperity. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I guess the future of the partnerships for growth lies not only in the area of financial support from the government and private sector and uh, civil society, but also from knowledge sharing. And uh, this is what I talked about uh, uh, the last point of my speech and I would like to emphasize that knowledge sharing and expertise sharing between the countries and between the um, actors uh, is crucial from my point of view for the further partnership develop development and uh, of course we cannot avoid financial support and uh, I guess the 
the future of the partnership for growth uh, may also include more private sector engagement, more involvement in the uh, different sustainable development projects in different areas and scopes. Thank you. Yeah, over the last uh, several decades, the nature of development partnership and development finance has changed. It is no longer prescriptive, uh, it is much more of a partnership as countries like ours, our economies have grown, our negotiating skills have improved, and we have uh, much more confidence in setting our own development agenda. Um, private sector has a much bigger involvement nowadays in development financing, in both providing it and in uh, also accepting it. You know, 20 years ago, the Asian Development Bank, I used to work there uh, for a time, did not finance private sector enterprises directly. Today they do it, and they are trying to increase that uh, window. It's just an example. So um, over the next few years, certainly the story of uh, partnership for development and growth, it's going to have to be a win-win engagement between state and non-state parties. And at the end of the day, everything is about keeping our people front and center of the dialogue, keeping the citizens of this region, because it's one of the most densely populated uh, regions of the world. And ultimately, uh, at least for Bangladesh, our people are our greatest strength. Thank you very much.